Welcome everyone to the School of Policy Studies. My name is Warren Maybe, and I'm the director of the school. Uh, delighted to see everybody out uh, on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> before we start off, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting here on the Indigenous territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, and as always, we're grateful for the ability to meet and to talk and to discuss uh, on these territories. Um, <clears throat> Before I introduce today's speaker, I'll just point out that next week uh, we have a, a team from OASIS, which is a program for senior supportive living, uh, and Helen Cooper, who is a distinguished fellow in the school, will be uh, leading that off, but I believe it's a group that will be presenting. Uh, it looks like a very interesting discussion, so I encourage you all to come out uh, and listen to that. Today's talk uh, is by one of our own, so today we're, we're pleased to welcome Kathy Brock uh, to the podium. Uh, Kathy is a professor in the School of Policy Studies. Uh, she is cross-appointed into the Department of Political Studies. Uh, she is a senior fellow with us here in the school. Uh, she has a whole list of uh, uh, credit and, and, and roles behind her name. Uh, I'll give you a few. She's uh, been the chair of the National Accreditation Board for Programs in Public Administration. So she's very involved with how we teach public administration right across the country. Uh, she is the former president of the Canadian Association of Programs in Public Administration, or CAPA. Uh, and she was a national research chair for the Institute of Programs in Public Administration. Uh, she's published a number of books and articles and reports on nonprofits and, and comparative politics and government. Uh, she's well known in the area. Uh, we're delighted to have her as a member of the faculty and we're delighted that she can be here today uh, to give us her talk. So please join me in welcoming Kathy up to the podium. Great, thank you. Can everyone hear me all right? Okay, today I'm going to be talking about the Supreme Court of Canada as a policy actor, and I'm going to be using two cases on national securities regulation to drive this forward. And people said to me, we didn't think that you were into securities regulation, what are you doing? And I said, well, I like money, so why not? No. Um, but I like these cases because I was working on a number of decisions by the McLaughlin Supreme Court, and I was very critical of them because of what they were doing to the realm of executive discretion, the ability of ministers to make decisions. And I thought, the court is overstepping its bounds. So the securities regulation case came along in 2011, and I thought, ouch, this one really is going to hurt the concept of ministerial discretion in practice. And then, so I wrote a couple of papers on that. Then in 2008, the Wagner Court made a pronouncement on a national securities regulator. And I thought, interesting, it now allows what the McLaughlin Court didn't. And I thought, why? What's the difference? And when I read the decision, I was surprised because it's a subtle rebuke, correction, of the McLaughlin Court. And I've noticed that there's now a trend in the Supreme Court to reestablish the position of the courts with respect to both the legislature and the executive. So I wanted to explore that with you today. And I have presented this um, versions of this paper elsewhere, and I've had some encouragement to do so, in particular um, from the government of Quebec even though they've also said they disagree with almost everything I say. So um, bear that in mind as I go through. And we'll talk about cooperation or conflict. What's the Supreme Court doing as a policy actor? So my plan then is to talk a little bit about the concept of ministerial discretion. And some people have told me that this is the least interesting part of the paper, so I'm going to skip over a lot of that fairly quickly. But I will give you the recent contours around it. Then I'll talk about the 2011 decision and the balance of the court and why that decision is, is so interesting. It's a little odd. And then we'll go into the 2018 decision in contrast 
and then we'll conclude by looking at the implications for the relationship among the three branches, and in particular for ministerial discretion. So, and Canadian democracy, that little thing that we are sometimes concerned about. So, one of the things when we talk about the courts and the Supreme Court of Canada and what it's doing, we paid a lot of attention to the relationship between the courts and the legislative branch and how we've changed our policy process so that pieces of legislation are vetted to be compliant with the Charter and the Constitution um, before they're actually rolled out. Less attention, though, has been paid to executive discretion. Gerald Beyer has done a lot of work from UBC and coincidentally on national securities regulation and we've um, had some pretty spirited dis discussions over the securities legislation on this and, and I've done some. But I want to focus on two questions. To what extent have the two opinions set parameters around the operation of ministerial discretion in setting policy directions in intergovernmental relations? Because this is where we can really see what the court has done and some of the constraints it's put on our executive. And secondly, to what extent can the federal executive define the nature of intergovernmental relations given the division of powers set out in the Constitution Act? So what has the court said about that, about ministerial discretion, but then also about what the federal government can do in intergovernmental relations moving forward? And I suggest that the court has directed the governments towards a position of cooperative federalism very strongly in 2011. But by 2018, there is a little bit of flexibility built in that allows for more policy choices in future. So what is executive discretion? Executive discretion is basically what it sounds like, and that is the ability of ministers to make choices, to make decisions in areas where there's no statutory direction to them on how they must decide. So this is a concept that um, derives from royal prerogative, power of the crown to make decisions, and it's come down to our ministers. And there have been some contours applied around the um, concept of ministerial discretion over time. For one thing, it has to comply with what parliament tells it to do. If there is a statute that constrains decisions in an area, Ministers must comply. That's one of the fundamental principles. And we have a principle of parliamentary sovereignty, parliamentary supremacy in our system that operates to say to the executive, you are not, your discretion is not unfettered. There are clear <coughs> limits to it. The dangers, and we've heard about these dangers, whether it's Dicey or McGregor Dawson, over the years, people have said, but there's real dis dangers when you talk about ministerial discretion. For one thing, it could lead to an arbitrariness in the law. And that's not felicitous. We don't want to see that. So that can be problematic if there is arbitrariness. Also, it doesn't sit well with the rule of law. The rule of law is certain, noble, ministerial discretion gives a lot of power to one individual, so there's an uneasy relationship there. And there can be power that is ill-contained. It's not contained appropriately. So this can lead to serious problems. And the courts have assumed a greater role in deciding what is the appropriate realm for ministerial discretion over the years. Initially, the courts were quite deferential to the executive and they set down some clear rules. But they have, and this just gives you an idea of some of the biggest shifts, as the courts have expanded their jurisdiction and limited the areas of executive discretion. So originally, they were deferential. They said, does it conform with the laws written by parliament? And within that realm, then, the executive can do as it chooses. Then they start to say, well, what about procedural ground? 
And then they said, well, you know, it's, it's not just that the process has to be fair. So they moved even further. And they said, there has to be some substantive review of what the minister is deciding as well. So does the outcome comply with what was expected? And then they became a little more aggressive. And the court started to say, but is the decision fair? Because certainly that's something we expect in our system, that ministerial decisions should be fair. And when the charter came in, it was compliant with the charter. So does it achieve what we expect from the principles of natural justice? So the courts began to expand their powers of reviewing executive decisions, and we certainly saw a major shift with the, operational, um, the Operation Dismantle case. So where, where does that leave us? What are the contours now? Well, there are some established norms around ministerial discretion. And I want to point out some of these that I think are very important. First of all, the empowering legislation will set the parameters for the exercise of ministerial discretion. And that's where I began. Ministers must act in accordance with statutes, with what Parliament tells them to do, with, or in the case of the provinces or uh, territories, what the legislature says, or what the Constitution says, because that is the predominant statute in the country. But flexibility. Part of the reason why we want ministerial discretion is because we want our governments to be able to act quickly and effectively to address key problems, provided that it's fair. So we want our ministers to have some discretion when they see that something has been done that's unfair or something needs to be corrected, they can exercise this discretion. So yes, they must conform to the statutes, but they must have some flexibility. And the courts have said, that's valid and that's important because it's through ministerial discretion that you get individual cases or outliers for a law corrected. Ministers can take care of that, particularly if they are responsible. And the courts traditionally said deference should be greater when it's a policy matter under consideration. So if it's something that is in the area or the realm of policy, we're going to give the minister more discretion. And they said, because we can't just say, minister, you're wrong because you want to see social services expanded and we know the government's in a tight budget situation, so we want to see social services cut back. They can't just substitute their policy preferences for the policy preferences of the government. Courts have said, that's not on. That's not legitimate. We're courts. We're not the key policy makers here. So those are some of the really important ones. And the other one I would point out is that the courts should not substitute their preferences for ministerial preferences when engaging in procedural or substantive review. And that flows out of the previous one, that they don't want to just say, here's my view versus your view, and my view holds because I'm wearing the red robe. So the courts then need to respect executive discretion. And also, I would add, when I say the executive legislation, legislative and judicial branches of government, the ability of the legislature to check the minister. Hold on to that idea, because we'll come back to that one. Come back to all of these, but that one in particular, because it's an interesting one. So how did we get to the issue of a national securities regulator? This is a fascinating issue because it deals with the ability of our governments to regulate financial markets. And Canada is one of the only jurisdictions, industrialized or federal, that does not have a national securities regulator. We have decided that this is within the provincial realm of power, and so the provinces 
have predominant control. Constitution Act, the federal government can make legislation for trade and commerce or criminal law. And it's never been disputed that the federal government will prosecute criminal infractions dealing with national security. That's never been into dispute. The provinces agreed that's federal jurisdiction. But the provinces argue very strenuously that because they have control over property and civil rights, securities are theirs. They are not the federal government's. And they hold on to this jurisdiction very tightly. In particular, Ontario, which likes having the headquarters for securities here and wants, if we create a national securities regulator, it wants it in Toronto. Um, Montreal, or Quebec, Quebec says it should be in Montreal. And Quebec wants to maintain its control, although it's compromised more than Ontario on what it does with the other provinces. Alberta, Alberta says, you know, Ontario and Quebec don't get us, so we want to have control here. And BC, and BC said, but we always come up with the most creative solutions, so we have the answer for um, securities in Canada. And the other provinces all have their regulators, but those are the really big players and the ones that really get locked into arguments with each other. So traditionally, we've had provincial schemes under provincial powers. And then along came 2008. And 2008 was fascinating for Canada. Because if you remember, that for financial turmoil, Canada managed fairly well. And so people said, obviously our scheme is working very well. But the federal government said, whoa. We had the Bernie Madoff scandal. We had the Conrad Black scandal. We would not have been able to deal with that effectively in Canada. And we had a lot more trouble dealing with that, the Conrad Black component of that than the United States did. They said, we also could not enact changes dealing with securities to prevent further problems in the future because we have such a segmented system that's divided among all the provinces. And they said, we need a national securities regulator if we're going to deal with an increasingly globalized world where markets are getting much more aggressive internationally. We need a national securities regulator. So they moved ahead. And the federal government came up with a scheme. It talked to the provinces. It did some interesting things that I thought. Um, one of the biggest opponents was BC. So they took the head of the BC securities regulation regulator and they hired him to lead up the creation of a national securities regulator. And then they brought people in from Ontario and Quebec who had influence in those markets. So the federal government was really trying to get the key players involved and come up with a scheme for national securities regulation. But Quebec said, we're not on side with this. We're gonna challenge it. So it started a challenge in its courts and then it was interesting, one of the footnotes on this is how national unity issues come into play here. Because the Quebec challenge was going up and the federal government decided that it was going to refer its proposed scheme for national securities regulation to the Supreme Court of Canada. And the provinces began to talk, and I only know this from talking to a couple of friends, but they said, we're really worried here. Because if we get a split decision between the Supreme Court of Canada and the Quebec court, we could end up in a national unity crisis. And so they talked and Alberta said, well, we don't like the scheme anyway. So Alberta also started a reference case so that it would be a little divided. But as it turns out, it was the Supreme Court of Canada that took over the case. So here's what's interesting. The McLaughlin court in a unanimous unsigned decision came out and it said, boy, we're dealing with a question of executive discretion, ministerial discretion here. And we're dealing with a policy matter. So we want to be very careful 
in how we actually handle this question. And I was talking to um, Eric Knudsen from the law school last week, and we were both talking about how the McLaughlin court always kept saying, we don't interfere in policy matters. We will not interfere in policy matters. This is a policy matter, therefore, we will not interfere. We will be deferen deferential towards the executive, towards the legislature. So, in this decision, the 2011, they said, okay, we're not going to make a policy decision on the advisability of a national securities regulator. We're not going to go there. All we're going to do is look at the legislative competence of the two levels of government. Can the feds do this under trade and commerce or their criminal power? Or is it provincial jurisdiction under property and civil rights in all matters of a local or provincial nature? And it said, in order to answer this question, we're going to go to the text of the Constitution. We aren't going to go into policy realms, and we aren't going to say which government is better placed to do this or to deal with international markets. And so there is a position of restraint from the court in that it didn't outline the details of securities regulation. It didn't tell the governments how they have to move on this question. But. And this is the big but. It did say, and, and read this statement, because it, it comes up in a whole number of places in the decision. The Supreme Court kept saying, cooperative federalism is the way that we've got to go in this country. Most jurisdictions around the world are moving to an approach of cooperative federalism to intergovernmental relations. Governments should cooperate across jurisdictions if they're going to deal effectively in a globalized environment. So it's not for the court to suggest to the governments of Canada and the provinces the way forward by, in effect, conferring in advance an opinion on the constitutionality of this or that alternative scheme. Yet we may appropriately note the growing practice of resolving the complex governance problems that arise in federations, not by the bare logic of either or, but by seeking cooperative solutions that meet the needs of the country as a whole, as well as its constituent parts. And they refer directly to cooperative federalism. And this follows coming out of the decisions on the Insight case, again, very strongly in favor of cooperative federalism, and assisted dying, medically assisted dying, again, cooperative federalism. The McLaughlin Court took a very strong, and you could even say aggressive position on cooperative federalism as the approach to intergovernmental relations in a globalized world. Then it doubled down. It went even further. It said, we're not going to interfere in policy matters, but it said, you know, one thing we don't get is the need for a national securities regulator if the federal government has adopted an opt-in scheme. So one of the components of the proposed scheme by the federal government, and I mentioned how it had been talking to the provinces and bringing in the different players from the provinces, was there would be a national securities regulator created. But it wouldn't apply to a province until the province opted in. Makes sense that respects the provincial rights to decide. But the Supreme Court said, wait a minute, if you have a prop provincial opt-in scheme, then that shows you don't need a national securities regulator. Because you wouldn't need provincial opt-in, everybody would agree to it. Okay, that's one thing to keep, keep in mind. And the language was very fascinating because in a decision on the securities regulator where they referred to direct judicial precedents, all of a sudden they say, you know, and this is kind of analogous to what the federal government did on Stats Canada and doing away with the national census. 
And as you're reading it, you just go, whoa, wait a minute, where did that come from? But it comes across then as a rebuke to the federal government and its approach for open federalism. The federal government at that time, under the government of Stephen Harper, was saying we have to respect provincial jurisdiction, don't interfere, we will operate in our jurisdiction, provinces will operate in their jurisdiction, and where we need to cooperate, we'll do on the basis of respect. That's a very different approach than cooperative federalism. So it came across a bit of a little rebuke to the Harper government. But then secondly, the, at one point, the court that was not going to engage in policy decisions said, the federal government has read all of the reports on the creation and the need for a national securities regulator this way. We don't read them that way. We um, disagree with the federal government. We think our provincial system is working well. And at one point, it dismisses the Minister of Finance's opinion on securities and what's happening and provides no rationale for dismissing the minister's opinion and what the minister's advisors had cautioned on this. So they said, with the federal government's regulating the securities industry, local needs might not be taken into account. And we don't find the minister's arguments to the contrary that national interests have to be taken care of first convincing. And it finished with going back to that first point. The dominant model in jurisdictions today is towards cooperative federalism. Very strong decision. And they said overlapping jurisdiction and flexibility within it. So the court was essentially directing the federal government to what approach it would have to take in intergovernmental relations. And as I mentioned before, this is in a number of decisions where we've seen this. There is a policy choice here with some implications, because when you say to governments that it must be cooperative federalism and that's the approach you have to take, you're constraining what they can do in future and how they can approach policy issues that have an interjurisdictional dimension. The other thing is, is provincial unanimity, unanimity required? That certainly seemed to be applied with their comments on the provincial opt-in clause. They've got to get everybody on side first if you're going to do anything with this. And the executive was certainly constrained. So, federal government provinces went back to their respective jurisdictions. In 2013, the federal government signed a memorandum of understanding with five of the provinces and Yukon. It included Ontario and BC and then some of the other provinces. And the memorandum of understanding outlined a new national securities regulator with provincial agreement and it would have provincial legislation that regulated securities and made them consistent across the country, which was not surprising because the provinces had worked on a passport system. So that one of the biggest problems with, or one serious problem with the securities regulation in Canada in the past was that if you were a corporation operating in Canada, you had to get, and you operated in a number of jurisdictions, you had to get approval in each jurisdiction separately to have your securities license certificate. So what the provinces did was they had talked and they said, look, the feds are going to try to create another national securities regulator. We're going to forestall this by creating a passport system so that if you're approved in one jurisdiction, that approval applies to the other jurisdictions. And the provinces came on side with this, largely. They all agreed that they would accept the decision of the securities regulators in the other provinces, with the exception of Ontario. And Ontario said, our decisions should be accepted by all the other provinces, 
but we will review each of your decisions individually and decide if we agree or not. So, um, so it wasn't surprising that we would see um, a scheme that said there should be more provincial cooperation. And Ontario said, and we agree, provided that we are always the lead because we are the financial capital of Canada. So um, the federal proposal then said a model provincial capital markets act that the provincial legislatures could pass and they would transfer some jurisdiction to the federal government and its um, national securities regulator, the third point there, and there would be a national act and it would focus on systemic risk rather than intruding right into provincial jurisdiction. So there was a nice balance actually that was created here. And there'd be a council of ministers that made decisions of a regulatory nature that then the provinces would accept. So the question went forward from Quebec this time. Alberta didn't join it. Although Alberta said we are opposed and we want the federal government to get a reference opinion on this case. And the question was, does it federal, fetter provincial jurisdiction by putting in place, particularly the ministerial council that's going to be making decisions and the federal minister is going to be leading it? And is this within federal jurisdiction under trade and commerce? Quebec court said, absolutely. Trade and commerce is within federal jurisdiction, except for the parts that deal with regulation and decisions about regulations and then they violate the constitution and the system would be invalid to that extent. So essentially they gutted it. And it said it also fetters provincial le legislatures. So what did the Wagner court say? It, it began in a really fascinating way. In its obiter, it said, what is cooperative federalism? from the court's point of view. And it said, it's not our place to tell the governments how they have to behave. We can use this as an interpretive aid. And they said, cooperative federalism and as interpretive aid to us to say, this is how we have to respond to actions of the executive and legislature. If they decide that they want to cooperate in an area of provincial or federal jurisdiction, then we should allow some creativity. So they took cooperative federalism as a direction to the court on how to understand what the executive and legislatures are doing. This is traditionally a much more responsible way of approaching the question than binding the way that the governments must act in future. So it's a cooperative, it's an interpretive aid, and they said, and it means that we're trying to we try to get a harmonious reading of statutes, to figure out how the governments can work together best according to how they've told us they want to work. Very, very different than the McLaughlin Court. And then they looked at the actual case and they said, executive discretion has to be given some latitude. And when we're considering what the government is doing, we should be trying to strike a balance between the three branches of the government. If the government is complying with the statutory provisions, if they are respecting the division of powers as laid down in the Constitution, then we should stand back and respect that. And they looked at the question of opting out or um, the fact that in this legislation, provinces could opt out or choose not to be part of this legisla legislative scheme. And they said, boy, that makes sense. Until the provinces want to come in, they shouldn't come in. Now, this was fascinating. One of the things that the Wagner court did in Obiter was it said, you know, the provinces can opt in and the provinces should think about this because Yes, the scheme is set up in such a way that it doesn't bind future legislatures or parliaments. But and the court said, you know, the political risks, if you engage in a national securities regulator and then you want to back out in future, the political risk can be pretty high. So you might want to think carefully about what you're doing. 
you're giving up a lot of jurisdiction here. And it's kind of cute, because when you read the decision, it's like they're saying, have you really thought this through? But if you have, okay, we'll go along with it. it it's kind of funny the way it's written um, to them. And they do this in the middle of the decision, and then they do it at the end. They say, by the way, you realize that if the provincial legislatures give up these powers, they're going to have a hard time ever getting them back. So think about this very carefully. But that's a very different thing than saying, we don't think you should do that, as the previous decision did. And they said, so even if some provinces opt out, it doesn't indicate that there's not a need for a national securities regulator just that some provinces aren't ready yet. And they said, and one of the key ways that they distinguished the case from the McLaughlin decision was, they said, we're going to look at this as a trade and commerce issue. And the question of risk is brought forward. And those are two legitimate areas where the federal government can play and without infringing on provincial jurisdictions. So it's intravirus. So the other thing that they did, and I'll mention this just quickly, it's fascinating though, is they talk about the relationship between the three branches. And they say, and this I found really interesting between the difference between the two courts. In a time when we talk about constitutional supremacy with the charter and the constitution, and judicial supremacy with the court becoming more aggressive in judicial review of executive and legislative decisions. This court said, parliamentary sovereignty means that the legislative branch of government has supremacy over the executive and the judiciary. This is a really important idea. The court reminded everyone, we live in a democracy. Ultimately, it's parliament that decides. And they might make silly decisions or politically risky ones, like to transfer up powers to the federal government, but it's the right of the legislatures and parliament to decide. And they cautioned the legislatures and parliament to take a look at what the executive is doing and to make sure that they comply with it. So we have a court now that actually is encouraging parliament to take a more active view. And it even has a section where it talks about um, whether or not the MOU between the governments is legitimate or not. And one of the principles that it comes down with very strongly is that the executive cannot make decisions for the legislature. The legislature can reject them. Again, strengthening parliament and trying to recreate a new balance of power among the three branches of government where the executive and the judiciary must listen to parliament. So I thought in 2018, there was a fine line that was respected here. The Supreme Court under Wagner tread carefully. It upheld the power of the executive to act and to decide and the power of the legislature to act and decide as well. It's, it's respecting the principles of the Westminster model of government. But at the same time, it limited both branches. It said to the executive, be careful. You have to listen to parliament. And it said to parliament, be careful what you agree to. This, led, this executive might be a little, um, at the, and when I talk about the executive, not just federally, but even at the provincial level, they might be giving up things a little too quickly, so be careful in your scrutiny of the government. And it encourages both branches to be cautious, but creative and flexible as they're dealing with national issues. So it said, we're gonna let Canada come into the world of a national securities regulator, particularly in a globalized environment where you're, you have markets that are more volatile and challenges becoming more frequent but we're going to respect your decision and ultimately the power of the public sector to advise you on what is right to do. So, to what extent have the two opinions set parameters around the operation of ministerial discretion? 2011 clipped the wings of the government and the executive very strongly. 2018, 
seems to have restored the balance, but it hasn't given the executive a carte blanche. To what extent can the federal executive define the nature of intergovernmental relations given the division of powers set out in the Constitution Act 1867? 2011, it looked like we were bound into cooperative federalism, but 2018, it said, no, our governments have policy choices that are important to maintain. So both opinions exist, and I guess we can only hope that all branches of government will pay heed to this decision and be as flexible as they've asked the governments to be. So thank you. And there's the current court for you. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks, Kathy. That uh, I think is a really, really useful overview of some of the changes and the things that have been going on. That's on, That's on now. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so we do have some time for questions. I'm looking around the room to see who wants to kick us off. <clears throat> we also will have Slido up if uh, people want to pose their questions through Slido. So who would like to kick us off? Thanks, Mark. Yeah. I'm going to bring you the mic. George, yeah. <laughs> so Thank an economist Kathy. starts. <laughs> yeah, so I, I see that the, the biggest national security issue now today is probably 5G Huawei. So would the, will the uh, Supreme Court have a say on that issue? Or is the executive or legislature, legislature have like more you know, weight on, on the decision? Well, right now, um, the direction of the federal government will be critical. And it's certainly at the ministerial level, and they're getting advice from the public sector on this. And so it'll be executive first, but then depends on how they decide to proceed. So it would likely go to the legislature next. And then it can always be challenged by Canadians. So, so for example, um, a lot of people are very concerned about the health risks because they're one of the big um, proponents of the 5G and bringing it into the country and if the, some of the health risks are borne out then you could legitimately see a challenge going to the courts to the decision to allow them in with 5G dealing with right to life liberty and security of person so it would be life and security of person on that um, and the regulation of it would be ba according to which provinces um, give it powers to operate there. Okay, thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you, Kathy. Um, and I have to thank you because you read an earlier version of this paper after I wrote the 2011, so thank you. Okay, uh, well I squandered a fair bit of my uh, career with uh, pursuit of a national securities regulator from an Ontario perspective, so uh, I, uh, I won't go and dis be disputing your mischaracterization of Ontario's uh, <laughs> <laughs> rights at uh, the Natural Centre for Canadian Capital Markets. You must um, have been talking to the person from Quebec who heard me too, because that's what they said. <laughs> the, uh, what interested, I mean, whose, whose court is it, I suppose, is the issue. I mean, the first round, and I was involved back then, there were executives from provinces that took different positions. Ontario supported the federal position, Quebec and Alberta opposed, others did, others opposed as well. Post the decision, there was a reconfiguration. Um, and some provinces, I guess just the executives, weighed in and said, well, okay, we'll move forward uh, on a cooperative basis without, uh, without federal leadership. Um, cooperative federalism to Quebec, Alberta, uh, meant, I think, the Canadian securities administrators, no federal government. That's a kind That's of right. cooperative uh, federalism. So I know you're dealing with bigger issues, but uh, there's an executive in each of the provinces as well, and a legislature. And I guess, parenthetically, I might add that clearly the role of the legislatures, each of those provinces, each legislature has to adopt that legislation for them to be in, yeah. uh, should it ever happen. Anyway, That's thank right. you. I'm not sure there's a question exactly in that. But. No, but you raise a lot of really interesting issues because the Ontario position has been fascinating um, to watch it go through. 
Part of the reason why it could agree to the creation of a national securities regulator and why the challenges came out of Alberta and Quebec was they wanted the headquarters in Toronto and they wanted to be the dominant player and um, under Jim Flaherty he agreed as finance minister that that should be the case and so he actually was looking at putting it in Ontario um, and that's why he brought Hindman in from the BC securities regulator because he thought he could then sell that to BC as well and so Ontario could come on side but that's when Alberta and Montreal said, or Quebec said no we you know we object to that and it the provincial opt-in schemes are so important because they do uphold the right of the legislature to make the decision and to review what the executive has decided so I think you're absolutely right on that it um, personally I, I, I honestly thought and this was one thing that Gerald Bear and I really disagreed with in um, just before the 2011 decision came down I had read all the decisions on securities regulation which there aren't that many over the years and in the 1960s the Supreme Court had positioned it for us to create a national securities regulator and then in a couple of de subsequent decisions it had signaled that it was considering opening up that to the federal government and the court didn't go that way in 2011 which is why it came as a shock to so many people and Bayer said well the chatter among the governments was that it wasn't going to be approved so so thank you other questions <coughs> Thanks very much. Kathy, first of all, I read, I think, yesterday that the chair of the Securities Commission Ontario has resigned ahead of her term, obviously in a huge dispute with the Ontario government. Um, I read the article, just, that's just a footnote, I read the article, I really don't understand what's going on, but maybe you have some insight. Uh, my question, though, which I find fascinating in all of this is, um, the court's recognition of the legislature, uh, whereas uh, various publications in recent years, I'm thinking of the Michael McMillan one, I can't remember what it was called, uh, interviewing MPs. Uh, Tragedy backbench, of the Commons. Yeah, thank you. Backbench MPs uh, who were quite candid, this is in minor, sorry, majority government situations, in saying Parliament has no power at all. It's all executive power. Yeah. And uh, so I, I just wonder if you have a comment on either of those things that I've raised. Sure. Um, actually, yeah, I saw the article um, that was... <laughs> yeah, that's the article that uh, talked about her resigning on it. And she does object to um, some of the well, the Ford government introduced a five-point plan with the goal of creating confidence in Ontario capital markets. And she said that it's, um, she disagrees with what the government is doing. It's becoming too directive um, for the agency, so she stepped down. So it, it shows some unease, um, but also I think with some of the appointments that have been made to bodies like this when a new government comes in into, into power um, with that. So that's one of the reasons why I was really heightened by the, um, or I was really encouraged by the Wagner court, because when it started to talk about parliament and strengthening parliament, I thought it was really important. I am a fan of parliament and what it can do. Something that struck me when I was doing the research on this was I looked at the concept of ministerial discretion and executive discretion and I looked at the PCO instructions to ministers on how to exercise ministerial discretion. And one of the things that in 2011, and this surprised me, the guidelines set down by the Harper government said, if a minister is making a decision that is not defined by statute, which way to go, then the minister should be very careful to make sure that it's fair, that it's consistent with any pieces of legislation we have, and it listed them, including the Charter, the Constitution, and other um, legislative documents. And then it had a phrase that it said, 
something to the effect of, but if the minister is in doubt, then the minister should consult the deputy minister and the Ministry of Justice. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's, that's right, and Parliament, as, and Parliament as well. And I thought, interesting, because the Harper government was supposed to be in term, it was supposed to be executive dominated in control and that language. So then I decided to update that section and I looked at the guidelines set down in 2015 by the PCO under Justin Trudeau. And it said, ministerial discretion should be exercised, um, bearing in mind the minister is accountable to the prime minister and parliament. And I thought, now this is fascinating because that's an irrigation of power to the prime minister's office and the prime minister himself. And so it, it actually surprised me, and I'm hoping that we return in future to the language that you go, to your you go to your deputy minister, you go to the Ministry of Justice, and you go to Parliament um, for decisions on this. But I do find the empowerment of Parliament quite um, good to see. Okay. I know we have a couple of questions that have come in through the Slido, oh. uh, and maybe we'll just take the first one, which is, should the federal government have proposed a national securities regulatory regime to which the doctrine of paramountcy, which is a word I don't know very well, uh, <coughs> applied, I think, to only one regulator. Does that make ah, sense to you? It does. Oh, so essentially yeah. then, um, in federal provincial uh, division of powers, there's a doctrine of par paramountcy, um, with the exception of with respect to agriculture and immigration, and one other area that has come up recently, but generally, federal paramountcy applies. When there's a conflict in the laws, um, the feds win. So they could have done that, but if they were going to do that in this area, they are taking on, and one of the arguments that's made by um, people from social democratic or uh, neo-Marxist perspective is that the closer you get to money matters, the tighter that governments try to keep control and maybe that applies here, um, or it could just be responsibility and concern over the purse, minding the purse, as the former ministry, Minister of Finance in Alberta said. Governments really don't like to relinquish control over money matters, over finances, because that's so vital to governments. So I think if they had gone with the national security regulators and <coughs> principle of paramountcy, they would have been in a major fight with the provinces, whether 2011 or 2018. And the provinces, I think, probably would have united against the federal government on this. So that's an interesting question. Okay. Um, I'm going to do one more off Slido. Uh, and I think I'm going to do the second one because I, I like the sound of it. So should the legislature, the executive, or the courts determine if legislation complies with the Constitution, Constitutional uh, Convention and the Charter. This one, that's a deceptive question because it's a tough, tough question, but it looks fairly straightforward. So I'm going to deal with it a little bit in segments. And I would say the, the first rule of defense for the citizens in a country, and I know this comes at a more American conception of liberal democracy than a traditional Canadian one, um, because it shows that the state is opposed to the citizens. So maybe my phrasing isn't the best. But the first line of defense is the public sector, in that it should always ensure that when it's advising governments, it's giving the best advice it can on how this does or doesn't comply with the Constitution. So I think that is, is critical, um, and that certainly picks up with the talk that was given last week by Gregoire Weber and talking about the need of um, the legislature, but also implied in that the public sector to ensure that human rights was taken seriously at that level. So the first check should be the public sector. 
then Parliament, I think, has to have a really important role. I would agree with Gregoire Weber on that entirely, that our Parliament has to be the primary defender of rights and freedoms and has to stand up for them. And it has to always be conscious of its role as the body that expresses the will of the people through the Charter and through the Constitution. But as said in the McLaughlin decision and indirectly in the Wagner decision too, that sometimes our governments and legislatures are not going to get it right and sometimes the best defense is going to lie with the courts in understanding how the court, how the Charter and the Constitution more broadly is written and the possible interpretations. So I think that would be a key role. And then the executive has a, an obligation to comply with the law. It just, it, it has to be conscious of that. And again, that's what our public service is there. And the clerk should always be advising the prime minister, the premiers um, of their constitutional mandates as well. So I guess, in my view, everyone. Primary jurisdiction would seem to be the courts, but I think it divides among all actors. There's a couple more questions up on the Slido. Are there other questions in the room? Because we're coming close to the end of our hour, and I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to ask. I'm not seeing any hands up, so I think we will go uh, to the next one. It sounds very similar, actually, but we'll ask it. Uh, who should determine if the exercise of ministerial discretion complies with the Constitution, Constitutional Convention, and the Charter? Well, and that also, that does remind me, when you say Constitutional Convention too, those are not enforceable by the courts. They are enforceable in the legislature and ultimately by the people. So ultimately the people have to um, make a decision on what the governments are doing. But with the exercise of ministerial discretion, Specifically, ultimately, it's got to be the executive and the ministers who are deciding. But I don't think judicial review is a bad thing as long as it's mindful of the principles that the courts have established over the years. When it goes too far and when the courts are directing the governments on policy choices, giving them direct instructions, that's when they're overstepping. But if the courts look at a decision taken by a minister and say that's wrong, and that's wrong for these reasons, send it back to the executive, send it back to the minister, and then let them make that decision again, that's a very powerful check. And the reason why it can work is because ultimately then it's been signaled to the people that the government's made a bad decision and you have to pay attention to what the government is doing. It's kind of the heart of democracy. Can I add something? Just one well, yep. I'm sorry for I'm not disagreeing at all with what you're saying, but you also have to, in that question, is what do you actually mean? And are you, uh, who's actually deciding whether the discretion has been properly exercised or was it exercised within the correct framework of procedural fairness? And if it's actually, yeah. what you're saying, Right. And send it back if to they decide no to those questions, but they don't supplant their judgment for that of the person who right. has discretion. Which is what I just um, yeah. basically said to it that it's got to be the minister's got to make the best decision that's in the public interest based on the advice the minister receives. If the court, the court then has the prerogative, if it's brought forward to it, to review that decision. But ideally, you want it sent back to the minister. You don't want the court substituting its opinion for it. So <clears throat> this is a great place, uh, I think, to wrap up the discussion. We're right at 1 o'clock. Uh, these issues are very complicated.
uh, and it requires a lot of thinking and, and pondering to work your way through and I'm really grateful that we have uh, Kathy Brock to work through them for us. Uh, so please join me in thanking Kathy for this.